to the end. Thank, thank you. Hello, everybody. This is our last lecture together. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to go over each chapter and kind of draw attention to certain things in each chapter that are important. You know, now these things are not the only things you should study, but it's the it's the key element of those particular uh, reactions. If you understand this key element, you can expand upon that and uh, use that to that knowledge to kind of figure the little detailed bits around the big piece. And so that's kind of what I wanted to start with today. And then, <clears throat> and I'm going to go through each of the 10 chapters we have from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 21 and look at each of those and what's important. Okay. So uh, for uh, our administration, of course, our final begins tomorrow at 2 p.m. It lasts until 4.30 p.m. So you have a total of two and a half hours to take the exam. It will be 70 questions, multiple choice, okay? It will be administered on top hat with our uh, procedures set out that we had before. Everybody seems to have figured out all the little details for that. I didn't have anybody get locked out last week so or the week before, so that's great. So that will be uh, what we're going to do. I see a hand raised. Um, hi. Um, I wanted to ask kind of like how numbering was going to work on the exam or the final. So I know in the exam we'll have like if we're, when we were testing over like 14 and 15, you'll have like 15.3. So then we knew it was like from chapter 15. Will it kind of be like that just because like some of the chapters like yes. one thing and what should happen is actually I usually I randomize the them so they kind of all come in a weird order. Uh, this one should actually be in order. I'm going to start with chapter 12 and the seven questions from chapter 12. Chapter 13, seven questions from chapter 13. So in theory, that's how the that's how it should run. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. And you can put your hand down. Sorry, let me do that. Or I can just high five you, you know, one of the two. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, so that's it. Uh, homework is due at midnight tonight, and it's reviewable for the last two chapters is reviewable after midnight tonight. So all the other homework should be open and available to you to review. And so those are, uh, so try to do your last reviewing on the last two chapters. Okay. Now we haven't had an exam on the last two chapters, so look toward the homework as a good representation of the questions I will be asking for that, those two chapters. Okay, so let's see, that be said, okay, so after our exam on Friday, I'll go ahead and run the numbers, make sure it was a valid test, and if there's any uh, curbing to be necessary, I'll do that. Note, it is out of 200 points right now. It says it's 203.78 points. I'm not sure exactly how it calculated that. I'm trying to figure that out right now, but it should be out of 200 points. Okay, so tomorrow morning, I will add the homework grade for chapters uh, for week five. And then the only grade that should be missing in Canvas should be that final exam grade. Okay, so double check all of your stuff. Make sure that everything is in there the way it should be. I did a little housekeeping on the, uh, on the, on the Canvas website because it had some things had two places after the decimal, some didn't. So uh, double check those just to make sure. Uh, I think I only had one or two translation errors so far, but we've caught them and got them fixed. So uh, after the exam on Friday, I'm going to go ahead and rack and stack the numbers Monday morning, I'm sorry, Friday morning, and I'll post the grades there. Uh, double check your grade on Friday morning and go ahead and email me if there's an issue, okay, or if you want to talk about something on Friday, because I'm going to submit my grades uh, sometime Friday. Uh, afternoon, and so it's easier to change things with uh, when it happens. Uh, what if pictures don't show up for uh, a question in the final? Go ahead and skip that. I'll go back. I, it turns out if I go back and unassign it or, or change its point value, uh, it regrades everybody's and shows up as the correct grade. So I've been working on uh, doing some test runs through Top Hat. Every picture has shown up in my three test runs so far. So I hope I figured out what the problem was, but I've loaded it two or three different times 
and it seems to be working. <laughs> so I'm hoping we don't see that. But if you do have a problem, if there isn't a picture, go ahead and just skip that question. And I will uh, just, uh, or just uh, click all the answers. <laughs> no, just skip the question and I'll, I'll unassign it and we, it'll auto grade it for me. So I really like that about this. In old Scantrons, I'd have to go manually figure out what was wrong. So that was, this is a, actually a great function for me as well. Okay, we're up to about 20, what, 25 people. Okay, so that is our administration. Uh, go ahead and uh, currently on Canvas, it might say if you have a 89.5, it might assign you a B. Don't worry about that. I will change that letter grade at the end. I'm trying to figure out how to change it so that it'll curve, it'll start, you know, it doesn't truncate at 90 or at 80, so I'm, I'm figuring that out. But uh, so I will be assigning it as, you know, if it rounds up to the whole number, then that's what your uh, letter grade will be in the class. Okay, any questions about administration or the final before we move on to part two? Okay, well, go ahead and think of your questions. We have the chat open and we have a small enough group here that we can uh, just talk. I'm gonna share my screen with my, uh, there it is, all right. So the, the first thing I wanna talk about is how to, uh, you know, give you some ideas on uh, studying or kind of, you know, gathering all of this information. We have a lot of information. But I think that when you gather the information in something like this table or a reaction diagram, you'll start to see similarities here, okay? And so I gave you these reaction tables for 18 and 19, but I think they're representative of what you can do for the other chapters, okay? And so I, I was thinking about that last night and I went, oh, you know, this is a great example of one way to correlate everything together. The other one would be to actually have another column and say going from this material to this material and then how to get back. So if you had another column that said, okay, I use this reducing agent to get here, but then I use this oxidizing to get back. I think adding that kind of thing, especially in chapters, uh, chapter 12, uh, is going to be the, the only other thing I would add to a reaction table. Now, Notice on the reaction table, I can have a name. Uh, not all of them have names, but it's gonna be things like addition reaction, substitution reaction, oxidation, elimination reaction, you know, things like that. Those are the types of names that you can have for these. And notice on this particular table here, um, I specifically drew, you know, there's a CH2 there. That CH2 is part of the reaction. So that's why it's there. There, You have to have a hydrogen there, an acidic hydrogen there, to make the reaction happen. Notice not all of them have that because in the halo form reaction, you have to have this methyl ketone and you're oxidizing that methyl ketone to the carboxylic acid. So by taking it and drawing attention to the functional group change and the part of the molecule that is required for that functional group change. I think that is a good way to start gathering all this information and getting it straight in your head. And again, especially in the reductions and oxidations chapter, if you start with like an aldehyde and you can oxidize that to a carboxylic acid, well, what are ways you could re-reduce that carboxylic acid back down to an aldehyde? I know we can't do it directly, because we learned that in our carboxylic acids chapter, but we do have a reagent for that. And so starting with those kind of, you know, going back and forth, I think is the best way to try to, and that, that'll cross all the chapters. All the chapters will end up on the same table at the end. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about getting this uh, material all kind of in a row. Okay, and I started with um, chapter 12 last time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually start backwards. I'm gonna start at chapter 21, give you the top three things in chapter 21, then we'll go to 20 and 19, and et cetera. That way we'll make sure that we have time because I did cover a couple of the chapters yesterday. Just wanna make sure we have plenty of time to do everything. Now, this is also your opportunity to play Stump the Chump, 
okay, ask me questions that are, you know, that you, you, you want the answer to that are related to that chemistry. So I should know the answer, but if we don't, we're going to figure it out as we go. Okay. So, <coughs> so pulling up our cross coupling reactions, of course, the first thing about these cross coupling reactions is we have a carbon metal metal bond. Okay. Hence organometallic. Okay. So that's the key there. And it's a polarized bond. And we're going to use that bond to our advantage to create new carbon carbon bonds. Okay. So in all of these, we have this polarized carbon carbon bond. And in all of these, carbon carries the negative charge. Okay. In all of these, the uh, metal is the less electronegative element, and therefore the electrons go with the carbon. Those electrons are the one creating the new sigma bond in all of these reactions, okay? Except in the metathesis reaction where we are exchanging a pi bond, okay? So um, once you create your carbon metal bonds, and there's a couple different ways to do it, uh, when we have the organolithium reagents, we actually are changing the oxidation state of lithium from lithium zero to lithium plus one. In the Grignard reagents, we're changing the oxidation state of the magnesium from magnesium zero to magnesium plus two. So in lithium, you have two equivalents because you end up transferring a total of two electrons. In magnesium, you have one equivalent because you're still transferring two electrons to create that reduced carbon anion, okay? So that's a, a subtle thing about that. And we don't make the copper salts, the Gilman salts directly. We always make them from the lithium reagent and we use two equivalents of our lithium reagent with one equivalent of copper and we end up with two carbon copper bonds and then a total of a negative one charge which is counterbalanced by the lithium. So the creation of these organolithium or these organolithium reagents help us kind of go move on to the other organometallic reagents. So in creating the boronates, we use an alkyl or aryl lithium to generate the aryl borane. In all of our examples, we actually used aryl boranes. The aryl borane is the most stable, so that's the most commonly used. And the driving force here is that the, the alkyl lithium, or the aerial lithium in this case, is much, much more basic than the alkoxide that's created. So it's a true acid-base reaction to create this new lith carbon boron bond. And we use that same kind of strongest base is displacing a weaker base to create the stannanes or the tin-based compounds. Notice the leaving group here is going to be chloride. Chloride ion is a very weak base, and therefore we're hitting, we're displacing a weak base with our very strong carbon anion. Okay. <clears throat> so then each of these reactions has a name. Okay. And each of them is very specific about what kind of carbons are used in them. Okay. So um, I don't. Let's see. Um, just the general concept of the mechanism is the important thing, is that you start with a metal of some sort with ligands on it. You get an oxidative addition into the metal. You then transmetallate the other component. And then those two components, now that you've selectively added one first, then the other one, selectively eliminate and create our new carbon-carbon bond. Okay, so that's the, that's the most important aspect of the mechanism. The next most important aspect of the chapter 22 is the names of the reactions and the types of carbons that they bond, okay? So the HEC reaction, we generate a, um, a vinyl group using either an S, starting with an SP2 hybridized halide, and a vinyl group, and we lose a hydrogen. That's why there's a base as part of the catalyst system here. If we look here, there's always a base, like uh, this is a triethylamine, and it always generates a, 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 a salt out of there because we're removing a hydrogen from that vinyl group. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter what's on that alkene in the, in the starting material here, it can be a donating group or a withdrawing group, 
but it's always going to substitute on, on the less substituted side. Okay, that's the key here. So we have an sp2 hybridized carbon with a halide on it, and it's attacking, a, it's replacing a hydrogen on another sp2 vinyl group. Okay, and that's the heck reaction. Okay, and so these are examples. Again, notice that it's very specific. It always goes on the side with the two hydrogens on it, whether there is a substitution or not. Okay. And the common theme in all of these reactions is the stereochemistry of the alkene uh, halide is maintained. If you start with a cis alkene, you end up with a cis product. If you start with a trans alkene, you end up with a trans product. Okay, so we're not going to do that. Okay, so once we go from that vinyl group where we're displacing a halogen in the heck reaction and we start to use boron, that's called the Suzuki reaction. Okay, so in this case here, you, all, you also have a halogen that is sp2 hybridized. So it's a vinyl group or an aerial group. And in most cases, our, our group here is going to be uh, an alkene or a uh, arene. So it's typically going to be a sp2 hybridized boron compound as well. Okay. And in all of these cases, we can have um, the maintaining of the um, stereochemistry of the alkene we're using. Okay. So if it's using boron and a halide, and they're both sp2 hybridized, it's the Suzuki, um, Suzuki reaction. Okay. The Stille, remember Stille is 10, Sn, Stille 10. Okay, in the Stille compounds, we have two reactions really. The first reaction is sp2 hybridized, going to a, a new sigma bond in between them. And the other one is the, using CO, so carbon monoxide. You can actually, in uh, adding an sp2 carbon to a CO to another sp2 carbon and generate a selectively inserting a carbonyl compound in between the two other materials. And this happens because of that mechanism where one has to insert first, the CO is already bound to the metal, and then the alkyl halide, I mean, sorry, the transmetallation happens third, and then when they then when they get kicked out of the catalyst, all three are found in the product. So think SN is stilly, 10 is stilly. Okay. The Shana Gashira is the first one where we had something other than an SP2, SP2 couple, and that's an SP3, S, I'm sorry, SP, SP2 couple. Okay, notice we have to have that hydrogen at the end, and notice we use a base. There is a some kind of HBr uh, or Hi given off, and therefore we need a base to catalyze this. We get a sigma bond in between our triple bond and our double bond, and we call that the sana gashira. Okay, alkyne to alkene coupling sana gashira. Okay, and the alkene metathesis reaction is where we end up exchanging partners in two different uh, alkenes and you eliminate a small molecule like ethylene and if you eliminate ethylene it's going to dissolve out a solution and you're going to drive your reaction to completion. Now the two modifications are that are you can close rings and open rings the same way. Okay. So the two modifications of that if you're not giving off a small molecule like ethylene here, you can open a chain up and give you a long chain polymer. The other way you can do it is you can close the ring as long as you're making a five or six membered ring. Those are the most commonly made by metathesis and it has everything to do with the ability to the entropy associated with five and six membered rings. So you can make them smaller than five sometimes but it's really strained. You can make them bigger than six sometimes, but it takes a lot. It's not as efficient. Okay. 
And then the last of these also involves an organometallic reagent, the one we didn't use very much in uh, the Grignard chapter, which was the um, Gilman reagent, which is the copper, the two equivalents of, of an alkyl halide on the copper reagent. In the Gilman, I mean, in the Corey House reaction, we can take, this is the first time we actually have an sp3 hybridized carbon making a bond with our system. This is the only one. Everything else was sp2 or sp, right? This is the first one we have with an sp3 alkyl halide in the coupling reaction. And it can be either part. It can be the halide or it can be the one on the copper. It's the only one that allows us to do that, okay? And just like in the other reactions, if you have stereochemistry on an alkene, you maintain that stereochemistry. Okay. And while it seems a little out of place, the Wilkinson catalyst is unique because it is a, it is a transition metal catalyst, but it's completely soluble in solution. And so like all, most, all of the other, um, you know, uh, uh, hydrogenation catalysts we use that use metals, they do syn addition. This also does syn addition. However, it's completely soluble in the solution, which is not true for our other reducing agents. Okay, so those are the top things, is the names and which metals are associated with those names. Uh, like Suzuki is boron, Stille is tin. That's the number one thing. Number two, stereochemistry is maintained and which reaction uses which hybridization. Okay, those are the three key things that uh, will help you correlate all of this information from chapter 21. Okay, questions on chapter 21. Um, I had a quick question about the Wilkerson's. Um, I for forgot what it was called, the last one that we just went over. What do you, um, need to know exactly for that kind of like everything or you just need to know um it's soluble syn addition and uses rhenium okay thank you hey the catalyst is this uh this rh right here and because it's like that it's completely soluble hydrogen binds to it and then it uh, adds across the uh, alkene and syn addition okay okay thank you Rhodium, sorry, not reading, rhodium. Okay. Any other questions on that? I'm gonna pull up chapter 20, okay? So the three key things we have in the amine chapter is number one, the basicity series, okay? The more aliphatic the character that amine is, the more basic it's gonna be. So if you have your, just alkanes on your nitrogen, it's gonna be more basic than if you started getting uh, alkenes or arenes. And then if those alone pair is being donated into uh, uh, some kind of aromaticity, it even becomes less basic. So that basicity series there, or the inverse of the acidity series is a key phrase in the amines, okay? And the nomenclature of the amines, is a little different. It's the only one where we care how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen, okay? All the other assignments, tertiary carbons or tertiary alcohols, that's how many carbons are bonded to that carbon of interest. This is the only one that actually cares how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen. So that's one unique feature and that's on the uh, nomenclature table, or uh, the nomenclature rules that is on uh, Canvas and Tracks, okay? Um, and we learned some common names in the aromatic region. Okay, and then the next most important thing about amines is selectivity. When we want just a primary amine, we can't just use a nucleophile in an SN2 reaction. We have to be able to trick it into only adding once. And so we have a couple different really uh, unique selective tools for allowing us to make primary, secondary, and tertiary amines. So for the first one is the Gabriel, only makes primary amines, okay? Uh, then we have some 
of rain rearrangements, okay? In rearrangements, you always spit out some kind of molecule, typically something, a CO2 or a CO3 uh, reaction, and you end up losing a carbon from your chain. So rearrangements always decrease the number of carbons in your chain. That's a key phrase in the rearrangement reactions. In the azide synthesis, where we can make a primary amine as well, we end up keeping the exact same number of carbons as was in your alkyl halide. Okay. And the reason the azide works well in only substituting once is you have one negative charge. Once it binds, it's done being a nucleophile and it's not very basic. And you have to reduce off the two other nitrogens to get to your primary amine. So you can yield a primary mean using that azide synthesis. Unlike the rearrangement reactions by adding cyanide to the system and reducing down, you've added a carbon to your system. And it's another way to make primary means. So that gives us four ways to make primary means. One where you have, two where you have the exact same number of carbons, two where you lose carbons, and one where you add a carbon. When we move to things like uh, aromatic amines, it's, you can't make aniline directly. You always make it by nitration and then the reduction. But once you have that aniline, we learned that we have a bunch of reactions we can do. Um, the oxine reaction is not as important. I'm gonna skip this one for just a second. Once we have that aromatic amine, we have this series of diazonium reactions we can run. Okay, so once you make that aniline, you're going to treat it with uh, the uh, nitrous acid to create your diazonium salt. And then by choosing whichever reagent you want, you can get a wide variety of functionality. Okay, we can all, we could have gotten to the chloride and the bromide using other reagents, but we can't make the iodine on the fluorine. This is a unique way to make aerial iodides and aerial fluorides and it's by choosing those specific reagents, but you can make these all from the diazonium salt, okay? And so we can even displace an amine to create a hydrogen, and so we have a lot of different uh, opportunities for us once we create that. And the reason it is, is we've now created, instead of in the previous benzene chapter where we were, all of it was electrophilic substitution, we now can add our nucleophiles to this and we're losing that nitrogen. We're losing that nitrogen as a good leaving group. That's the reason it's working, is that we can do it. And we've made a really, really good leaving group and we can get these other things on nucleophilically. Okay, so let's go back up to um, another way to make uh, primary, and secondary, and tertiary means selectively is by reacting different things with aldehydes or ketones, okay? So by adding a, a nitrogen-containing compound, as long as it has an acidic hydrogen, it must have one acidic hydrogen, you can actually have your amine come in and displace water from an aldehyde or ketone. If you use ammonia, you get a primary amine. If you use a primary amine, you add a carbon to it and you get a secondary amine. And if you have a secondary amine and you add it to an aldehyde or ketone and kick out water, you end up with a tertiary amine, okay? Now this all involves a secondary step of reduction. And uh, typically uh, we use one of these reducing agents. Don't worry too much about the reducing agent. It's just the reaction going from the aldehyde or ketone knowing you're gonna displace water and end up with an amine based on the amine you start with, okay? And then the last one is that we can reduce down amides, okay? And in amides, it, depending on whatever amide you start with is the one you end with. So if you had a primary amide, you end up with a primary amine. If you have a tertiary amide, you end up with a tertiary amine. There's no changing of the system. So if that's one of the very cool things about the reduction of the amides is that you don't change the nature of the, the degree of the amine in the end. Okay, and 
So, benzo, ah, the elimination reactions, the Hoffman elimination, okay? So, the reason the Hoffman works is you have an, an amine that would be a very bad leader. You're actually gonna hit it with uh, an alkyl halide until it's completely substituted, you've turned it into a good leaving group. Once you've turned it into a good leaving group, you just need a little bit of base to do your beta elimination, which is an E2 reaction, and it evolves out a neutral species. So in the Hoffman elimination, it's you're converting your amine to a better leaving group, and it always tries to deprotonate from the least substituted side. So you end up getting an anti Zasevs a product. So it tries to eliminate from the least substituted side. So you end up with terminal alkenes or the less substituted alkene. And then um, the key thing about the COPE rearrangement is again, you're making the amine into a better leaving group by oxidizing. And when you oxidize it, it turns it into a better leaving group, and that allows you to kick out at that as a, as a neutral species. And anytime you can kick it out as a neutral species, that always makes it easier to do. So you're oxidizing the amine to make it a better leaving group. And again, you generate an alkene from this reaction. You know, unfortunately, there's no spectroscopy on the exam. I just uh, ran out of time. Okay, questions about amines, chapter 20. So when you're attacking a chapter 20 question, it's like, okay, is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine? How many carbons do I have on my starting material? If it's getting longer, that means I've done some kind of addition reaction where I used uh, like the cyano group. If it's getting shorter, oh, maybe it did something like a cope rearrangement. If it's just going from an amide to an amine and I'm not changing it, maybe I just reduce down my amide, okay? So look for number of carbons in the starting material in the product and then select your reagent appropriate. All right, questions on that? Where'd my uh, chat room go? Oh, there it is. All right, no additional chats, okay. Okay, I'm gonna move on to chapter 19. Okay, where's chapter 19? Let's do that. So chapter 19 was all about what can you do with an enolate, okay? And how we can do different reactions. And so the, the first part is, you know, 18, we learned how to generate enolates and why they were good. In number 19, we learned the reactions around them. Okay, and so most of these are actually let's go. all about creating new carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, so they have different names, and so the names decide which kind of functional groups you start with. Okay, and then we have a difference between a condensation reaction, which loses a molecule of water or alcohol, or an addition reaction. Okay. So in an addition reaction, we end up not losing any atoms, okay? So if we have a Claisen reaction, we only see the removal of an alcohol from the system. So it's always a condensation reaction. And we always end up with a beta keto ester. And we always start with an ester. So uh, the Claisen is esters and you end up with an ester in your product and you always get regenerate your ketone because the alkoxide is a good leaving group, okay? We used the alkoxide to generate the enolate and we reproduce it at the end of the reaction, okay? <clears throat> so um, if you want to control your Claisen reaction, you make sure one substrate has no alpha hydrogens and the other straight does have alpha hydrogens and that way, you can make the enolate out of one of the components and it must attack the other. And that's called the crossed clase. And if you, of course, if you have two esters on the same molecule and they can make a five or six membered ring, 
that's the Diekman condensation where you can make a five or six membered ring with a dye ester compound. And again, it generates a beta keto ester. Now, if you have a beta keto ester and you uh, hydrolyze off that alcohol, you can now do a thermal decarbonylation, but it has to be a beta hydro, it has to be a beta carbonyl compound to your carboxylic acid to form that six member ring and kick out CO2. So the next most important thing in chapter 19 is the aldol condensation. I'm sorry, the aldol reaction first. In the aldol addition, think base with aldehyde or ketone, no heat. Okay, so if you don't heat the reaction up, you end up with a aldehyde or ketone alcohol. Okay, so it's just addition, you haven't lost your small molecule. So think base with no heat. If you add heat to that reaction, you now turn it into the aldol condensation, you lose water, and you end up with a conjugated ketone or aldehyde with a double bond in that alpha beta carbon position. Okay, so addition, you have an alcohol, heat, you turn it into a condensation and you have a conjugated uh, carbonyl with a double bond, a carbon-carbon bond. Okay, and then of course you can also do cyclizations and those cyclizations are intramolecular aldols. And again, we're only wanting to form five and six membered rings. Okay, um, so that covers all of these and then we already did the, oh, we need to do the Michael addition, okay. So once you've created this unsaturated uh, aldehyde or ketone right here, you can do that addition, that, uh, that beta addition reaction using a nucleophile. Because what'll happen is you'll have that, it's a one, four, one two versus one four addition, and the one four addition works with weak nucleophiles. If you have a strong nucleophile, you'll end up with adding across the carbonyl. Weak nucleophiles, you'll get that, that addition of the beta carbon to give you a wide variety of different substrates. Any weak nucleophile will generate that. Uh, weak nucleophile. All right. <clears throat> and so if we're using an enolate as our nucleophile, it has a name the Michael addition, but it's just the exact same thing. We're adding something to that beta carbon of an unsaturated aldehyde or ketone, and that, re and that generates our beta addition product. And then we just do some examples, and we can do thermal decarbonylation. Yeah. <clears throat> And then the one derivative of that is this manic uh, reaction, where you've added one extra carbon to the chain by pre-reacting your aldehyde and your amine. This creates an aminium cation, and then that acts as your nucleophile. And uh, that, I'm sorry, that is what it's attacked by your, uh, your enol. <clears throat> all right, questions about 19. So 19 is all about, I generate an enolate, <clears throat> and where does it go? Okay, enolates want to either do addition reactions across a, uh, across a carbonyl compound, or they're going to want to do a four, a beta addition across a conjugated carbonyl compound. Okay, so, but it's all about attacking with soft anions, I'm sorry, weak nucleophiles, that means the same thing, but we didn't learn that phrase, so. Um, weak nucleophiles will give us these types of products. <clears throat> All right, questions about 19. <laughs> Got about eight or so minutes before we're gonna take a break. So let me do chapter 18. So chapter 18 is all about generating those uh, and those um, <clears throat> uh, uh, enol, 
enolates, it's talking about enolates, generating that, deprotonating those alpha hydrogens, finding them, knowing which ones are most acidic, and generating that <coughs> enolate ion. And there are some thermodynamic versus kinetic aspects to this, okay? So the first thing is finding the acidic proton. And when we're talking about these acidic protons, we're talking about something other than an alcohol or a, or a base. So we're looking for things that are the alpha hydrogen, the things next to the carbonyl, okay? Oh, this is the clazing. Okay. That was also in 19. Okay. So the clazin is in chapter 18. I already did the clazin, the cross clazin, and the aldol. Okay. So that means 17 is the one where we look at the alpha hydrogens. Okay. So in the alpha hydrogen, we want to look for the series. We want to understand why the acidity increases as we go to more and more electronic drawing groups, okay? If you understand this, you'll know exactly where you're gonna generate your enolate, okay? And then if you know where you're generating your enolate ion, you'll know that's the carbon that's gonna be attacking all of your substrates in the clazin, in the cross clazin, the Diekmann, the intramolecular alcohol, the alcohol. Okay, so generation of that thing is important. Okay, uh, knowing what eno keto tautomerism is, it is not resonance because we're moving a proton. We're moving a proton back and forth between two locations. Therefore, you're moving mass. Therefore, it's a tautomer, a tautomerization. Okay, and because it moves through an sp2 hybridized to an sp3 hybridized carbon, you can actually racemize or change the stereochemistry around uh, the carbon, that alpha carbon to the carbonyl here, you can change that stereochemistry. So knowing that enol keto tautomerism happens, knowing that it has a stereochemistry element to it, and then figuring out which one is gonna be more stable. The more you can stabilize that partially negative charge over more atoms, the more likely it is to be in the enol form, okay? The, the less stable that anion is, the less likely it's gonna be in the enol form and the more it's gonna be in the ketone form, okay? So, you know, two total strongism. And, Again, the interesting thing about this is that we have a set of reactions that happen even though we don't form that enol in a very high concentration. The fact that it forms at all, we can take advantage of that because we can slowly do reactions on there. Every time it forms a little bit of that enol, it reacts like an, like an alkene. And when it reacts like an alkene, you end up with alpha substitution at that position, and then you regenerate your um, <clears throat> carbonyl compound. So one of the things we can do with that, that reactivity, is we can do nice little acid-catalyzed halogenations, okay? Just a drop of acid is enough to get there to get a, a halogen on there. So we have that reaction here, and this is uh, in the reaction tables we also looked at. <clears throat> we can get base promoted halogenation. And in base promoted halogenation, you can do more than one, okay? In acid catalyzed, you'll only ever substitute one. So if you want just the monohalogenated, you do an acid catalyst. If you want more than one, then you do base, <clears throat> base uh, catalyzed system. But the other thing about that is if you have a methyl ketone, all of the hydrogens will be replaced and it'll turn it into a carboxylic acid. <clears throat> and that's our halo form reaction. Okay. So, and that's our halo form reaction. Okay. So <clears throat> a derivative of that is you can do it with the carboxylic acids. However, you really need to, one of the intermediates is turning into the acid halide. And if you add water at the end, it goes back to the acid. If you don't add water at the end, you can keep that acid halide.
but it's basically a derivative of that acid catalyzed uh, um, alpha halogenation, but you can do it with a carboxylic acid. And the key reagent here is phosphorus because you want that oxygen to end up transferring to the phosphorus until you get it back. Um, let's see. So the benefit of doing the monohalogenation at that alpha site is now you've activated that site to be displaced by SN2 reactions. Instead of attacking the carbonyl, your nucleophile can now just do an SN2 reaction and you can functionalize your system. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, we can use it to our advantage to uh, make a new carbon-carbon bond, but it's the same kind of concept. And then we talked about the decarbonylation reaction already. If you have a beta keto carboxylic acid, you can decarbonylate that and generate just your keto. And the malonic acid ester synthesis is a good way to add that beta ketone to your system. And then of course it's compatriot is the aceto acetic ester system. The difference here is you already have a methyl ketone on your system. And so in this case, you're adding a methyl ketone. In the previous reaction, we were adding two carboxylic acid esters. And so we end up with a different product here. Here we'll always end up with a methyl ketone. In the other system, we actually end up with longer ketones, ketones other than methyl ketones. Or sorry, carboxylic acids. <clears throat> and then they decarbonate as well. So the, noting the difference between the, the malonic acid ester, you end up with a carboxylic acid, and you can have one or two substitutions. And the aceto, uh, acetic acid, you'll always end up with a methyl ketone at least. And then the stork. Yeah. I guess we do use it. Mm. It's just a way of trapping it in your enolate, but let's not do that. Okay, so that takes us up to right about 1250. Uh, we've gone through uh, several of the chapters and kind of the highlights of if you learn this topic and then get around that and like, how do I make it and do those things. That's kind of what we're looking for in what we're doing today. All right, any questions before we take a break and come back at one for our last few chapters? Okay, uh, nothing's in the chat and nobody's waving at me. I got a thumbs up. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and stop sharing, stop recording.